Live from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE on the ground. Covering KubeCon 2016. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation and Red Hat. Here's your host, John Furrier. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE special on the ground coverage of KubeCon or Cloud Native Con. This is an event in Seattle, uh, booming with attendance, great growth from last year, and we are here in Seattle covering it all. And my next guest is Dan Kahn, who's the Executive Director of the CNCF, which stands for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's a mouthful, but it's super important. Um, part of the Linux Foundation, welcome. Thanks so much, really glad to be here. Yeah, so big fan of what's happening here. One, uh, the event's awesome, great. Up uptake from last uh, attendance from last year. Yeah, unfortunately maybe a little too much. We're uh, <laughs> a little crowded in the foyer and a little bumping on the way into getting the restroom and everything, but it's uh, one of the challenges of fast growing technology space is trying to figure out a year ahead of time what size space to get. And how many people to squeeze in without getting the fire marshal on your back. Exactly. <laughs> Certainly this is going to be a great one because you know the hallway conversation has been spectacular and normally the excitement is pretty strong at tech events like this because they're developers, so there's a lot of collaboration going on. But you have a kind of a, 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 an air of really uh, forward thinking, entrepreneurial kind of thinking going on here. And I haven't seen that in, in a while. And I think that's a, one of the main things that we're seeing that came out of the containers, mm -hmm. Kubernetes, I would say the unveiling and the clarity of at least a path. Yes, absolutely. And the importance of that. So that's been super important for the developer community. Now, making that an open part of the, a foundation, an open source, has challenges. So that's what you're doing. So give us the plan. What's the strategy? Sure. So I'm uh, actually relatively new to the space. I just became the executive director five months ago. And uh, this is somewhat of a coming out party. This is the first big event that we've run. It's the first Cloud Native Con. And it's really just been extraordinary. I mean, I'm thrilled to see the range where we're getting some of the biggest companies in the world of the Cisco's and Huawei's and IBM's and Red Hat's and such, and then tons of startups and uh, a lot of, of real diversity in the end users as well. Of startups looking at Kubernetes, massive companies just saw a great presentation from Ticketmaster about them having 50 year old technology that they're uh, moving forward and putting into containers. So, and the growth of the market, one of the challenges is to kind of, you know, not so much be a chess player, but be a gardener, if you will, kind of <laughs> let, let, let the, the, the flowers bloom, if you will. And that's a challenge, because open source is very opinionated, but there's also a lot of passion involved. So how do you look at, what's your philosophy on establishing kind of a rules of engagement? Um, how do you foster the innovation? Certainly the market drivers are for more growth, but people have inhibitors on the enterprise we hear about you know, support and things of that nature. So how do you enable that? What's your strategy and what's your view? Sure, so CNCF is a very new organization, and uh, my goal on it is to look at a lot of the the giants that have come before us of like the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Apache Software Foundation and OpenStack. And uh, my goal is to try and learn from them and ideally to try and make entirely new and different mistakes as opposed to the ones that they uh, that they may have made in the past. So uh, one of the things that's a little unusual in our setup is that uh, we very much separate all of the technology decisions from the business decisions. We have a governing board of a bunch of the biggest technology companies in the world, the ones I mentioned, plus uh, Google and Samsung just joined, which we're very excited about, uh, a number of others. But uh, they can't actually adopt projects in. So we have a separate group called the Technical Oversight Committee, which is some of the top architects in the cloud space. So we have folks like Ben Heinemann of Mesosphere and Salman Hikes of Docker, Brian Grant of Google and six others. And that's the group that looks at new projects and evaluates them and talks to them and decides whether to adopt them into CNCF or not. Uh, and we feel that that separation is really critical so that uh, the technology decisions are not being biased by the business ones. Yeah, it's always hard to foster growth and innovation around business models conflicting with the technology enablement. That's really key. Uh, great to see that decoupling. Mm -hmm. um, so on the business model side, thoughts on things that you've learned and observed, uh, learnings that you've had in, in your past career and applying that now, I mean, debate rages on, open core to you know Apache, GPL, we saw some things going on there. So there's like all kinds of different approaches. Are there any thoughts of the winds blowing any way, way or the other? Sure, uh, I was previously the chief operating officer at the Linux Foundation between 06 and 10, and I definitely think you can, CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation. We took that model of saying, 
uh, that technology decisions need to be separate from business ones. One thing that's interesting to me is that when I was last in this space 10 years ago, people were perfectly fine, uh, you know, the Linux kernel's GPL, people were fine with free licenses like MIT and BSD. Since then, and for this group, there is an enormous focus on the Apache license. Yeah. And the reason why is the fear of submarine patents. And so the whole goal of CNCF is for us to be an intellectual property no-fly zone, that you can have all these companies that compete very hard in the marketplace, but they can come together and collaborate and share their ideas and their technology without the belief that a couple years later, someone's going to be able to trick someone else in with a lawsuit and, uh, yeah. and win that. And the Apache license is really the industry consensus right now for best practices. It's interesting because that no-fly zone gives the freedom for the creation and the invention side of it. Mm -hmm. Patent thing is always worrisome, but you know, in general, there's also the business model down the road kind of approach, which is let's go innovate. Yeah. Apache's done great on packaging, and mm -hmm. as someone gets some traction, it fosters the community aspect as well as a startup maybe no. thinking about packaging. Now, we have an advantage that uh, we're not, uh, unlike OpenStack as an example, we're not trying to come up with the projects ourselves. What we're actually doing is scouring the cloud native landscape, talking to different groups and saying, uh, what do we think is the best in class project out there? And in some cases it's more than one, but uh, today we just announced the fourth project that's added to uh, the CNCF. So we have Kubernetes, we have uh, Prometheus, which is a monitoring application, Open tracing is a tracing, and then today we just added FluentD, which is a logging solution. And this is the idea that if you have uh, dozens or hundreds mm -hmm. of different applications and projects that are each producing a log stream, and then you have uh, perhaps dozens of, of other applications that are consuming it, you don't want to have an M times N problem of, of creating adapters for all of them. Instead, you can plug them all into FluentD. It has over 300 uh, adapters for different solutions out there, and that provides one comprehensive approach. Uh, and, but what's interesting is that we don't need to win over the community and say, oh, uh, here's this uh, project you may not have heard of. There's actually over 2,000 uh, users of that today. But by having them here at CNCF, showing how it plugs into other technologies of ours, we think we can hope. And you're cross-pollinating. Exactly. And you're, you're letting it bubble up, and that, you're not being a yeah, that's you know, exactly dictator. That's exactly the metaphor. <laughs> dictator. But okay, and back to the um, uh, project side. This is awesome. So you mm -hmm. have some, you know, some some, some uh, gravity around these projects. Is there any cadence or expectation, or is it free for all in terms of the velocity of adoption of projects that the technical committee will oversight? Uh, we would love to be at the pace of one a month, and I don't know that we'll quite get that fast. Uh, one big change that we're hoping to make in the next month or two, um, when our first two projects were Kubernetes and Prometheus, those are two of the fastest growing, best respected projects uh, on GitHub right now. We didn't want to have such a high milestone for every other project we considered. So we're adopting uh, what we think we're going to call an inception stage of earlier projects that we're going to sort of try out, but they have to essentially prove themselves yeah. within 12 months. And hopefully that'll allow us to keep a, a, a pretty good velocity where we think there's a fantastic number of projects. We think as a community, yeah. we can Yeah, let can people fight it out, them. let it surface you know. stuff and let it, you know, let people kick the tires, right? Exactly. That's incubation uh, period, mm -hmm. basically. Right. Uh, what about the um, the forking and all the battle cage matches that go on? How do you want to handle that? Are you just let nature take its course? Is that... Uh, uh, philosophy there? Uh, thankfully, um, when we look at the space, and this is really coming out of the Linux space as well, anyone can fork, and of course it has a slightly different connotation now with GitHub, where yeah. when you make a change, you fork it. But there's also just a massive uh, centrifugal force pushing people together. And when you have a really high velocity of changes, the idea of forking and you would lose out on that becomes a lot less appealing. And so, so far, thankfully, um, all of our members and everyone in the community has really been on board on having a single head on working together to have that consolidation. We just had Richard Kaufman on from, uh, I think Robert Kaufman, I mean, from Samsung, he was talking mm -hmm. about that the number two contributor is other. Yes. Which is a nice balance to the whole critical mass well, it's feature. An, yeah, it's an incredible accomplishment, because for Google to pull in enough people that they're no longer the majority contributor is uh, something that we're thrilled with. Yeah, it's great to see you have Richard, Rich, Richard, Richard Kaufman. Yeah. Richard Kaufman. Um, Google is the number one contributor. Are you worried about that? Maybe um, they've been certainly good actors in the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had MapReduce and let Cloudera run with it. Look what happened with that. So, you know, we kind of all know the backstory of Kubernetes. They're kind of letting it bloom on its own. That's consistent with their current posturing? 
Uh, well, I, I don't think they want to have another Cloudera. Yeah, which is yeah. why they embraced Kubernetes. Exactly. But uh, I definitely don't think it's fair to say that they're doing it on their own. They're still the largest contributor of any one company, yeah. and they have a massive amount of resources, and I think they see it as a, a really key technology. Yeah. It's something they Well, what I was referring to is that call. Cloudera kind of took MapReduce under yes. their wing and made a commercial venture out oh, of it. Oh, yeah, them. absolutely. I think Google didn't want that. No, and they, I mean, the way they I think about it is um, they had this technology a few years ago. This is a, definitely oversimplified. They could have kept it as a proprietary in the house thing, mm -hmm. like Amazon Elastic Container Service. They could have made it an internal open source project like Go, or they could have just created a Kubernetes foundation that allowed other people in, but they still controlled it. But instead, uh, they were really interested in working with the Linux Foundation and creating this cloud native computing foundation that was always designed to be much more than just Kubernetes. And that really was about trying to push the project out of the nest. But I, I will say that uh, my understanding is they're still see yeah. that as an absolute core for their business. Yeah, you, I got to give Google props out there for that because they did do the right thing there. They put it out in the open. They did a line. Mm -hmm. uh, and they could have land grabbed that in, in a different way. I mean, certainly not the way that one was. But uh, final question on the on this event, KubeCon or Kubernetes Con, um, KubeCon, it's KubeCon, however people call it, uh, not to confuse with the Cube, this Cube yeah. product, yeah. for seven years and might be trademark infringement, but you know, we'll get to that later. There's a K uh, though. You know, it's a K, it's a, still causing a lot of confusion. Um, but um, that aside, Cloud Native Con mm -hmm. also is in conjunction. This is part of the expansion yes. you're mentioning. Talk about the vision for the events. You got one in Berlin coming right. up. Um, and certainly you could have had probably at least a, a few more thousand people here for sure. Uh, well, certainly a few more hundred, and, and we do feel a little bad that we didn't quite, uh, we didn't quite uh, aim high enough. So our vision going forward is that we have Cloud Native Con that represents all of our projects, and that KubeCon represents the biggest part of Cloud Native Con. So it's multiple tracks, it's what a ton of folks go for, but we think that uh, it also gives us a chance to expose those people to our other projects. And by the time we get to Berlin, we're certainly hoping that we have another two or three or more uh, and the projects date on that Berlin? added in. It's March 29th and 30th. Okay. And then uh, we also announced that we're going to be in Austin in early December. Great. And um, I'll say that for both of those events, we're tripling the capacity from what we had last year. Yeah. So we're uh, we're hoping not to be so crowded. I was talking to Andy Jassy last night. We had a one on one with him, and he was talking about the first reinvent. He thought didn't think he can get you know. 4,000 people there is backed. I think you might be have to look at more capacity potentially. Yeah, I the, mean, at this pace. It, it's the hard question is we'd actually like to be signing uh, contracts for 2018, <laughs> and it's just really hard to predict what the right size is to get for that because we. I feel terrible about the fact yeah. that we did turn people away, yeah. especially end users that we'd like to be. Uh, introducing to this space. So. Yeah, well, I can attest people watching this. Definitely a fire marshal issue because it's really packed. <laughs> That's why we're in a separate room here. The sunlight in the background earlier. Normally we're on the show floor with the queue, but yeah, it's pa every space is taken. Hallways are jamming. The other thing I'll mention, though, is that we are also interested in re going out and reaching uh, customers and vendors where they are. So we're going to have a booth at AWS reInvent, and uh, we're looking at uh, other conferences that we can be at to help spread the cloud native word. Well, we're, we're certainly going to be over to 100 events this year, so let us know where you're right. at. We certainly bring you guys on. I'll give you the final word. Tell the folks why Kubernetes is so important. Why is this movement, why are people so excited here for the folks that couldn't make it? Why is it, what's the vibe, why is it important, and what's the impact to customers in the industry? So, the belief is that if you're deploying a new modern software application, that uh, putting it into containers, using an orchestration platform like Kubernetes, dividing your app up into microservices, is uh, really uh, such a benefit in terms of uh, optimizing your resources and uh, tying into a whole rapid development process, continuous integration, continuous deployment, that not doing it uh, almost makes it impossible to compete. And so we think there's just a ton of momentum around uh, containerization and orchestration. And works. the speed of the innovation is one of those things, if you're not on it, you fall further behind. Exactly. And it takes more energy to catch up if you try yeah. to do it by yourself. That's Definitely. the benefit of the collective communities, and, and, and it highlights open source. Right. Big time, in terms of successes. Yeah. Dan, thanks so much for coming on, sharing the perspective. Congratulations, and uh, sorry for the folks who couldn't make it. Hopefully this video will help. Uh, this is theCUBE here in Seattle for special coverage of Cloud Native Con and CubeCon here in Seattle. Thanks for watching, I'm John Furrier. Thanks.